Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about things all music, motivation, and success. This has been a long time coming. This is coming to you from two states, Tennessee and Iowa. We're both under sheets of ice right now but here's the deal iowa knows how to deal with that they got plows they salt nashville not so much i can't get even get out of my neighborhood i'm running out of food i might have to eat my girlfriend i don't know it's it's going to be like the early days of the pandemic but uh you know usually i have my co-host uh co-producer jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers.com with me but he had an obligation unfortunately couldn't join us but i'm flying solo here but i'm so excited about our guest today Today's guest is a high-level drummer, musician, entrepreneur. He founded in Laurel Canyon in 2021, Yurt Rock. That's yurtrock.com. Yurtrock.com is the number one destination for musical creation tools featuring the world's greatest musicians. Of course, I'm talking about my friend Ryan Groose. How are you, bud? Good, man. Good to see you, Rich. It is good to see you. Well, I'm looking. You know, if if you guys are listening to this and not consuming it with your with your eyeballs, you can watch us on YouTube. Of course, I'm looking at um, Ryan. Always really put together, handsome cat, but he's always just got a nice workspace. Like if I were to show you my studio right now, Crash Studio, it is not feng shui. <laughs> your environment is just so crisp and clean, and just, it just I just feel like I'm getting stuff done. Well. I married an interior designer, so oh, you know, I you can't st- take credit. So you stole some tips and tricks from her. Oh, she just makes sure it's it's put together. So. Clean lines. That's right. Clean lines. So, man, you have such a diverse. You're you're a little bit younger than me, um, but you have a nice diverse musical background as a player as a product creator as someone who's worked at record labels you lived in a lot of musical cities um you have this background with this company called the loop loop loft which i'll let you brag on yourself a little bit but you came to my attention um when i would see all these ads on the socials on facebook instagram yurt rock yurt rock yurt rock what is this and i asked my friend blair Sinta. i was like who is this guy is he awesome can i trust him should i work with him he's like he's the best Are you kidding me you got to get in bed with this guy and you and i in the last one year if not maybe a little bit longer have created three musical products together so thanks for having me on the team man yeah, man. Thanks for thanks for being a part. I've always been a big fan of your playing and, you know, oh, watched man. you from from your socials and yeah, uh, it would as our good old Blair brought us together. So yeah. we love Blair. You. We yeah. Well, you know, Blair and I went to college together. I'd be I'd be going into like play drums and whatever Oak, you know, whatever lab band I was in that semester. And he would be either right before me or right after me. And we'd high five each other. and We had practice rooms next to each other. And of course, he went on to Los Angeles and became the drummer with Alanis Morissette and a million other people. And we are in that brotherhood of drummers. But tell me a little bit about Yurt Rock and exactly what it is. So yeah, like like you mentioned, um, Yurt Rock is is a home for musicians. So we it, uh, the focus is it's almost like fantasy football for for music making, where I try to record. You know my favorite musicians, drummers. There's a joke there somewhere. Musicians and drummers. Good at psh. Hey, um, and guitar players and keyboard players, but mainly drums. Um, and it stems from my previous company, which was called the Loop Loft, um, which I founded way back in 2010, and that was loops and samples. Started off just just me, my drums, and then you know I wanted to treat it like a record label. I guess we can get into that history in a bit, but I yeah, used to yeah. work. At Atlantic, at Atlantic Records, so I kind of had you know record label experience, and I was like, what if I kind of merge that with the world of drum loops and have like an indie kind of business where you know my artists are you know I had Omar Hakim and Matt Chamberlain and all my you know heroes, um, recording them and providing their loops you know and samples to people for you know royalty free because who's you know matt can only play on so many sessions a day but if we do the loop and sample thing and we even went deep and went multi-tracks like we did with you yeah uh, it'll you know democratizes 
the access, you know, to to his performances and lets everybody, you know, shine with him. So, um, yeah, it's it's I had the loop loft and that got acquired by Native Instruments in 2018. Which congrats, was, that's a goal of every entrepreneur, a, a being acquired. I wasn't even in the cards when you know when I started the company. I wasn't trying. I wasn't even really trying to make that much money. I was just trying to have fun and like yeah. kind of keep. You know, I I was kind of straying away from the music business for a bit, getting into digital asset management and kind of consulting and IT stuff. And then I kind of, I realized what am I doing with my life? Like I need to be playing drums. So every day at that last job I had, I was in Boston at the time, I would just come home for my lunch break, record a drum beat. And I'd post it on a blog. It wasn't even the loop loft. It was right. blog, right? Oh, and every day I would just post a logic session with the multi-track drum loop. And like write like a little story about it and it was just free and it was just like an exercise to keep me playing and just yeah. keep the creative creativity going while i was doing this this other kind of um consulting work and then that organically kind of got some traction and i started just getting requests for other loops and other drummers and that's where in my head i was like oh maybe there's something here you know i, I would open up garage band and the loops that were in there and logic weren't weren't that great i mean they're yeah. decent just not you know not not that inspiring to me so i so i just kind of doubled down and just kept kept going and going and going organically and um over the course of eight years you know yeah ended up selling to native instruments which you know i i use, use their products all the time i'm surrounded by their keyboards and <laughs> hardware yeah. still um so that was a wild ride uh took me to LA where I was head of head of content at Native and oversaw um, a lot of cool stuff. I, I got to do the Butch Fig drums with them. I produced that and was involved a lot with the guitar rig and all the just any anything content you know loop and sample wise kind of went went through me. So that was a great experience to be inside a big company like that. And yeah. after three years, I was ready to uh, start over again, and that brought me to nashville and that's when we met and yeah here we are now yeah i mean that is it that's a key point the the democratization of musical ideas concepts sounds i mean drummers alone and you move fast you know you get an idea you book that studio or you have the guy come over to your house you 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 cre you you gather the performances next thing you know there's a product there's ads following me around um, it, the ads are crazy because I'll tell somebody about my product, like, "Hey, I got three products on Yurt Rock." Da da da. I'll be telling somebody. Next thing I know, I'm getting all the ads for my product to me on Facebook. You know, the 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 algorithms are crazy, but these are just some of the drummers you have products: Daru Jones, Mike Clark, Blair Sinta, Victor and Drizzo, Dylan Wissing, Brian Fraser, Moore. Kirky B, Marcus Finney, Nate Smith, Todd Sugerman, Wally Ingram, Joey Warrenker. Ben Satterley, Antonio Sanchez, and then you even have a bass product with one one of my old college buddies, John Button, who was yeah. jamming with one of my drum loops the other day. But I love another idea that I love about this whole thing is speaking of like the democratization. I think that's how you say it. I don't want to butcher it, but Word, basically, yeah. yeah, basically giving everybody the same opportunity to collaborate and create with some of their heroes. You can create these super bands where you might have a bass package, say you have a John Button bass package and you put him with a Daru Jones on drums and then you have a percussionist and then a keyboard player and a guitar player loop packages and there's like a super band working together. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, I mean, that's, that's like I say, it's like fantasy football for music where you can swap out quarterbacks or drummer. You know, it's like you, you can yeah. try, try out, you know, whoever, you know, every, every, that's what's beautiful about I love working with these drummers because they all have their distinct style and DN musical DNA. And yes, you know, if Matt Chamberlain plays a drum beat and I just hear the beat, I can tell it's yeah. Matt or like even you or yeah. like everybody's got their own twist and how they just touch the instrument and hold yeah. the sticks. And you know, it's it's yeah, yeah, it's just an endless amount of inspiration. Um, and that's just why I love doing this. I get to work with. You know, being a drummer, getting to work with other drummers is like a dream job because normally we're kind of like ships in the night. You know, if you're touring, you're in a band, you, you know, you get to you have drummer friends, but you don't get to really work with them ever. Yeah. But yeah, I get 
sit down and nerd out with all these amazing drummers and and you know create really cool you know just make make cool beats you know like <laughs> we're making beats here you know beats, you know so just still you know still doing that i don't think i'll ever you know i always like wonder like is there ever too many drum loops and ever but like there's always you know something fresh about it and something different and you know music's always evolving and styles and yeah. sound and so just kind of staying i don't want to say on a trend but um it's you know it's just it's just fun the, the technology is moving so fast so kind of do, keeping the content going with that um just you know gets me out of bed in the morning so As, and when and you're so good at it and you're such a great drummer because i've seen you play in a variety of formats and the fact that you still have that other side of your brain that is cut out that is so methodical that is has a business mind and entrepreneurial spirit um data management what i mean mo drummers are we're droolers man i mean so you have that you have both sides of your brain that are working equally that's very impressive it's a very rare thing thanks yeah no i just yeah i whatever like this venn diagram of my skill sets you know like with the like the digital asset stuff and the marketing stuff and the record label stuff and then the performance you know i i went to berkeley school of music and have a actually it's right here did you graduate i did i've got my my wife is in the process of uh you know here's my diploma there you know. it is very nice berkeley college of music folks Mag magna cum laude you know honors. I love that that's one school that there's a lot of folks that don't finish because they get a gig or whatever so i'm always impressed when somebody finishes berkeley yeah i was i had a good group of friends uh, we were all pretty gung-ho um I don't, bob reynolds who's a lot of people know him as a, well he's a, one of the best sax players out there he plays with snarky puppy and he's got his yeah. own great solo career and played with john mayer he was i literally met him like on the first day of school at Berkeley, um, and realized we had, you know, some common interests and who, you know, we were in some orientation and we basically realized we loved the same music and went out for a slice of pizza after that and became best friends and then roommates. And then after graduation, we moved to New York together and did the whole thing and it's still one of my best friends. So yeah, Berkeley, Berkeley was such a great, great experience. And to this day, you know, I have so many friends and connections that stem as I'm sure you do from North yeah. Texas. You, you yes. can kind of trace everything back to Berkeley for me. That's for sure. that's cool. And you've lived in so many cool uh musical nuclear nu centers, nucleuses, like, you know, one of America's oldest cities, Boston, like classic uh music scene. Um Nashville, everyone's coming to Nashville, Los Angeles, you lived in Studio City and a yurt. Is that where the name came from? The yurt? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't living in the yurt, but that, oh, it was your studio, right? It, it was on the property, gotcha. and um, it, for those that don't know, a, a yurt is like a Mongolian tent that's got circular in shape, and acoustically, it's perfect because it's you know the last thing you want with acoustics are you know standing waves and square walls and all that stuff. So if you're in a round tent that's all fabric, and you know it, it sounded amazing in there. It was awesome. just a bone dry and like you know just super punchy and warm and um so yeah if, if you go to the website and click on the about us you'll see a picture of the uh, of the original year you know i'm in iowa now i probably i'm i'm there's actually a company that will come and build a year it's the same company that, that built the one in studio city and <laughs> i'm called Gro Gro groovy yurts.com i think wow is the yeah so go 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 get, get your own yurt you know <laughs> Because <laughs> I do remember asking you, what is a yurt? And, and Most people don't know. Yeah, it's kind of a weird, you know, like, and it's just a bizarre name. And I I was just sitting there staring at the yurt, and it's on a rock. You know, it's kind of a play on words of the yacht rock. And I, um, I wanted something, you know, the last company was so literal, was the loop loft, you know, which, which I guess was a good name because you kind of know what you're getting into when you, you know, go, go to a company called the loop loft. But yurt rock was kind of kept things more open because I'm, I'm doing stuff you know beyond loops and samples we have software we partner with plug-in companies and all of it so kind of you know it, the name i, I don't want to be restricted by the name and and yeah. so you know and we're getting into podcasting and some other stuff exciting coming up this year so oh really you have to tell me off the record yeah some some like a podcast a podcast network well or yeah it's it's we have uh, a season one with a very famous 
producer and um and then a former mtv vj as a co-host and nice can't say who and when yet but it's it's uh we're, we're getting it together for this year so that is incredible man and is it all about driving creating more awareness for the product or is it just a fun thing it's a, it's a fun i'm just executive producing it so i'm not even i'll be behind the the glass on that one and um but it's about each season is going to be about the making of a certain album and oh, okay. this, yeah, a very big album from the nineties that changed the face of music. That's all I can oh, say. Oh yeah. So there was one year in the nineties that like a couple of weeks apart from each other, like a million record, like app type for destruction came out. The Pearl Jam record came out the bad mother finger, whatever record. Well, from- yeah. The, 1992 or whatever. Like, it, yeah, that was a big great. one. Yeah. So, um, Yeah. It, that, that'll be exciting so stay tuned well, and what another thing i like about the products is that they're incredibly powerful they're incredibly versatile they're very intuitive to use but you keep the price point really very affordable like your average product is 39.99 yep and people are like what i'm like yeah yeah i mean because if you're to hire a drummer and a studio and an engineer that's i mean that's again that that was kind of the impetus for starting the company is i realized that if i could offer the, the these performances of these amazing musicians at an affordable price hence the democratization of it yeah um you know anybody you know you, you don't need to be rich to no pun intended you don't need to be rich to get rich you can, i love you, that so yeah. Well, I mean, my thing is, is like my one of my beefs, even though I love artistry, is if I'm a songwriter or I'm a producer and I want to get my musical ideas down, some of the loops out there are so dense or they're very treated and cinematic, especially some of the stuff that came along early in the drum loop the idea of the drum loop and the drum loop market. So I said, if I'm going to do a product, I want to have, I want to play those knucklehead things that you can pull up and get a feel for a song right away. So you and I, the way we organized it is we thought of specific tempos and feels related to hit songs as a jumping off point. And the people can basically just get a, what a wave file of the entire beat or they can have the individual stems so they can totally mix the relationship between each individual item. And we wanted to go high fidelity because a lot of the things that I get called for in Nashville, it's all about the big high fidelity pop country, pop rock drums. Because dead is so popular right now. There's a million dead packages. Every I was like, we don't need another one of those. We're You'll probably make a couple more, but... If I'm going to do one, I want to just do gigantic user-friendly drums. And I think that's what we did with uh, Modern Rock Drums, Volume 1 and 2. Yeah. I mean, those those sounded... We, 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 where Gray Box. We, Gray Box, yeah. That's one of my favorite studios in, in Nashville. Shout out to Cody at, at Gray Cup Box. Cody, yeah. Yeah. They're fun. We knocked it out. And then... Um, we didn't, but we didn't grid the performances. They were organic. They swam around the click a little bit. And I had some friends of mine that are like, Hey, I want to be able to open up any drum beat and any DAW and have it slam to the grid. And I was like, okay, well, why don't we just do a MIDI package? And you're like, why don't you come over and play my Roland kit? And we'll be able to change the sounds and we'll slam this sucker. So we called it locked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and we, that, that, that's done really well. You know, you, your friend was was right there was definitely an audience for it um, yeah you know so it, i like to offer both you know the, the organic stuff that's yeah. it it's not quantized but it's still edited so when you drag and drop it in it you know loops seamlessly without yes. any pop and all that stuff but we keep the we keep the mojo you know and all the notes you know the space in between the notes we don't i don't mess with that i you know yeah. I typically leave that alone but like for these special midi projects yeah, like locked is is exactly what the name says. You know, it's it's you know right right in there, perfect. Yeah, you don't want to grid John Bonham. It wouldn't sound well, that, the same. That wouldn't work. Nope. nope. <laughs> so take us back. You know, it's just a part of every podcast where it's like take us back Be- because you have such an incredible history as a you know a performer and. Um, someone who's worked in tech, record labels, the business side of the music business, and they they seem to cross pollinate. Yeah, totally. I mean, I guess I'll try to give you the quick 
background. Um, so I grew up here in Des Moines, just 15 minutes away from here. Um, and fortunately had a very good music program at our school and it was, you know, it was, they were heavily into like jazz and big band and like the whole kind of, it was almost like a sport, very competitive. And our high school was the one that always won the state championships every year. And, you know, marching band, big marching band and, and marching band too. Yeah. Drumline. We won the, you know, I was, I did snare and that, that was very competitive, like drumline contests. And then yeah. there were long days, man. You go to school at like six 30 in the morning, morning. And, <laughs> and then, and then jazz band would be a class and then you'd stay after school and practice. And so I was literally playing like eight hours a day in high school. Yes. Um, uh, so that that was amazing and and had there was a drummer four years ahead of me this guy jared cagwin who's still he, he lives in uh istanbul now but went to berkeley and amazing percussionist and but he had got, got a scholarship to berkeley and he was four years ahead of me so i was kind of in his footsteps and he'd come back for christmas and show me all the stuff he was working on and all the syncopation alan dawson stuff and like yeah. i don't open my eyes and ears to that whole world so Bert, you know i Berkeley was my goal then to, you know, uh, hopefully get a scholarship so I could afford to and which I which I thankfully did got a scholarship and so went to Berkeley in 96 and was there for four years and graduated in, in 2000 with a I, I was I actually started off my major because I'm really into studio and, you know, gear and all that stuff. I, I wanted to be a that music. They call it MP and E music production and engineering. So I I was there on a performance scholarship, but I was, I was, ah, I want to do MP and E, but I realized one semester in, like I wasn't even touching my drums. I was busy with, as you should be learning. Signal all the, path. Yeah. All the math and all the stuff, which I learned, which was great. Like, you know, one semester of that, but I switched back to performance and then, you know, that's cause that's why I was there. And, you know, when else, you know, in my life, I'm, am I going to have a chance to just do nothing, but just try to be the best musician possible. Yeah. Um, so graduated in 2000 and then I actually moved to LA. All my friends went to New York. A few of my friends went to LA and I had it in my mind that, you know, I was going to be the next Matt Chamberlain and get the next big tour and moved out there and quickly realized it's, it wasn't as easy as uh, I thought, you know, it's kind of shut up and get in line. <laughs> stuff, yeah. You know? Um, you know, it did the whole thing, the tooth, you know, back in 2000, it was like, you know, Ricky minor, he's still a major player, but like he was the big MD yep. that every, you try to get on Ricky's radar and do the auditions. And, um, but I ended up, well, I was broke. I had no money and, uh, ended up taking a, a I got, you know, I auditioned for this GB band for those don't, um, general business they, weddings and corporate and where are the tux and it's a society band society band you know but like I, I took the gig but i had to sign a contract with them that said i couldn't sub it and if i ever subbed it i'd lose the gig so was that that one that our, our it's um west coast music that's one no. of the big big ones okay. no I, i'm not gonna name them but gotcha they're, gotcha they're gotcha a gotcha. big one um they're a big so one financially it was you know it was great suddenly like i, I could afford where I was, I was paying rent with the, remember those credit card checks used to get, you know, just like, yeah, who knows what the interest rate was. So I, I, I was building up some crazy debt and then I got into this GB band and, you know, man, sitting on the 405 with a tux on in rush hour traffic just was not my, you know, I'm like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I had money, but it, it was just, wasn't good. So you didn't enjoy the, 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 the brown eyed girl and the, yeah, I was just stuck in this thing and I, I could see like my life you know, flash flashing forward in 30 years. And I was still sitting on the 405 with my tux on. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I can't do this. So I kind of went back to Iowa just to kind of regroup, you know, and like figure out my next move. And the next move was keep driving, you know, East until I got to New York where my, my friends were. And, you know, they, they just like, come sleep on the couch. We'll figure it out. And so I ended up there and slept on the couch and, needed a job and my girlfriend at the time she was working through this temp agency where they they sent her to atlantic records one day she's like yeah you know there's this if you you know go to this temp agency you might be able to you know tell them you're in the music you know you're a musician and they could probably hook you up so i i did you know went to the temp agency took the typing test and did all that stuff and um the next day or two they 
they had a job for me at, you know, at Atlantic Records. So I was just answering the phones in different departments and did that for like a week. And then the HR person there was like, um, yeah, there's a job opening up. Uh, I'm not sure if you're interested, but it's for uh, Amit Erdogan's assistant position. Because Amit is the founder of, of Atlantic and yeah. true legend. And I was like, you know, my head just almost exploded. And I was like, of course, yeah, well, that, that would be amazing. So how, how did the word get out that you were crushing your job that you had for one week and that you would be a good person to work for? Did he walk by a couple of times and be like, hey, this kid's on it. He's always on time. He's it wasn't him. I, I I think, and I was working, I, I spent a couple of days, uh, Ron Shapiro who was president at the time is filling in for his assistant. And I was kind of able to handle the, you know, it, there's a lot of pressure when the, the phone's constantly ringing. And like, you know, when you're in the C-suite there with all the executives, like I kind of proved myself there, I guess. And that, that, you know, someone was, somebody told the HR person that, you know, you know, Ryan would be a good guy for Amit's, uh, assistant position and so yeah two weeks into moving to new york then i was suddenly sit sitting outside amit's office answering the phone and uh, every day it would be it's like ari week. gold's assistant uh lloyd yeah lloyd, exactly get in yeah. Here. totally yeah yeah um and it was just like a fantasy world of like keith richards and mick jagger and like it, just the phone was constantly ringing it was constantly famous people and it was just like well that's crazy like uh uh uh, what was his last name? Ahmet. Uh... Erdogan. Yeah. Hey, line three. Mick Jagger's on line three. Oh, yeah, that was just normal. You know, like in his, and he had the Rolodex of God. Like it was just you. Every anybody who was every he had everybody's cell phone number, and everybody obviously would reach out to Ahmet because he was such a ah. influential person. So I, I was kind of in the mix there, and got to you know he took me under his wing and. You know, I would, he didn't do e email or any of that stuff, but he would still actively listen to demos that were coming in. And I'd sit there and take the notes as he would listen and give me his thoughts. And wow, I learned about the goosebump factor and all that stuff. And okay, he would preach to me about how important the catalog was. You know, you'd be like, you know, it's Led, Ze Led Zeppelin keeps the lights on around here, you know, and like just, you know, and that really stuck in my brain is the, the, the value and the worth of a legacy act. Of, or just content like like a great drum beat a great drum beat recorded 30 years ago is still a great drum beat today and yeah. it's just you know that, so I, I i knew that content had stay staying power and and if you just keep keep just keep striving for the best and so yeah worked worked with amit and then unfortunately you know he got old you know, older as the years went on and is he kind of re retired and then i i moved over to the art department and that was a fun job because I I, I was in charge of all the photo shoots and album designs and like oh that's big, yeah I was like you know work working on Stone Temple Pilots and all these other you know really cool cool projects that's but, amazing because you got to decide kind of like what railroad tracks bridge or alley you're going to shoot the rock band at or uh, under exactly and um which naked model there's I mean there's it, yeah. It, so it's like I I did their greatest hits album. If you open it up, um, my my name's actually in the uh, the thank you section there because I I did all the. Is this for Stone Temple? Yeah, their greatest hits album. Nice. Um, one of my projects. So anyway, I was working there, but then eventually Atlantic was sold um, and merged with Electra, and everybody got laid off. And this was in the summer of 2005, I believe. And but at the time, I was also playing in a rock band. I just joined this kind of cool brit pop indie rock band and we were playing all the the clubs in downtown new york pianos and all the lower east side places cbgbs and brownies was there a place called brownies that people right, brownies, brownies was our first gig yep. yeah man uh so we did that and the week after i got laid off from atlantic we got signed by peter asher who's a legendary um music producer and manager Incredible. you know his wife Jane Asher dated Paul McCartney and then Peter went on to run Apple Records for the Beatles and then Oh my god. I and produced James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt and just a legend and um his daughter who was was a fan of our my band and she brought him to our rehearsal space one day and it was like oh it was our audition you know we 
He's like, you know, play me, play me what you got. And we played and he signed us on the spot. Um, at the time he was working at Sanctuary, which was a big music company that's no longer around, but they, they had a big management firm where he was he head of the man management division. So it was us and he was managing the Cobain state that at the time. So all the Nirvana stuff and then Courtney Love as well and mm -hmm. uh, Jane's Addiction and Morrissey and, you know, and then us like he, so. He signs us. He's like, all right, come out to Malibu, stay at the house. We'll record at Conway. We'll get you a record. You know, it was like, I was like, oh, we're going to make come it. Come with me, kids. He's got the cigar. He's like, just follow me. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So suddenly it was like, I went from Atlantic to in this band that's being managed by by Peter and um, got to do a lot of cool stuff. But again, the industry, you know, every the 2000s were brutal, as I'm sure you can remember every year, just kind of the, the early post. aughts. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, the labels didn't know what to do and, you know, they were cash strapped. And, and so, you know, we we had a deal pretty much with Columbia. I still have the CD like printed up like the demo Columbia, like this. You know, we're about to, to, to do this deal with this band, but that I fell through. And, you know, we toured with Maroon 5 or did, you know, some shows with them. And but it, it eventually ran its course. And that's when I you know, got married and I was like, ah, this music business, you know, after getting laid off from Atlantic and then doing the thing with the band and music business was just in, in shambles in the late 2000s. So that's when I moved to Boston and took a job doing, you know, digital asset management. Um, it was a cool company called Continuum where they were an innovation firm. They're still there, still an innovation firm that would, you know, they, they would design products, but they'd also help companies with business strategy and like, they designed the Reebok pump and like the Swiffer, wow. like just, you know, they redesigned the Swiffer. They designed, they, they were the ones that invented the Swiffer. Well, Hey, you know what this, I just bought the state of the art Swiffer with the power jet and, uh, wow. it is a game changer. Yeah, man. You know, if you got, you know, dirty floors, Swiffer. <laughs> but, um, so anyways, so that, that, that takes me to those lunch breaks where I'd come home and you know, play, play it, play a loop and record it. And then, you know, and then 2010 was when the loop off started. So dude, incredible. I have always been a side man, working musician. I've never experienced the, the feeling that that must've been when a, when a fat cat with the cigar walks in the room and goes, you guys are signed. Like, like I have never, that has got to be an incredible feeling. It is. I mean, I still remember like calling my parents like after that, you know, rehearsal when he, you know, basically signed us. We, we, haven't, we hadn't signed the contract yet, but we, we you know, it, it was on. And uh, you, yeah, just, you know, going out to Malibu. I mean, that was just a whole trip, you know, like he lives in the Malibu colony, which is this very exclusive enclave. So, you, you know, you just you, Britney Spears would be on the beach and uh, Malibu is nice enough just to be in the city limits. But if you're in a special place where only special people can go pretty yeah. good. Oh, I remember like the first time we, we drove up to his house, I saw, you know, this attractive blonde lady taking out the garbage. And I noticed this barbed wire tattoo on her arm. And I was like, yeah, Pam I know Anderson. who that is. That's Pam Anderson. Yeah, Pam Anderson is taking her trash out. Yeah. His neighbor, you know? So like, yeah, that, you know, I mean, the colony's full of of all kinds of celebrities, but yeah. So that was that was that was a wild time. Um, you know, P Peter and I are still friends. I actually, when I was at Native Instruments, was going to do like a Legends series with him with all the drummers that he had worked with. But long, long story. Never, never. You know. Ah, you know what? Around, but I think started. I worked with Peter. Uh, I think I may have because I think he may have produced a demo on a young. Uh, just shredding guitar player named Johnny Highland. He's a blind guitar player. And I think um, maybe Billy Sheen played bass on it, but it was kind of like Billy wasn't there at the time. I don't know what happened. I don't know if the stuff ever saw the light of day, but I believe Peter Asher was in the room. It was a long time ago. There's many cocktails that have yeah. happened since then. Um, but uh, it was a nice, nice gentleman. Nice gentleman. Yeah, Pete, Peter, I mean, again, was... I had Ahmed as a mentor and then kind of Peter as a mentor too. Like, on yeah. the, uh, you know, I would always ask him questions and I saw how he managed, you know, estate management and all the, all these things that, you know, are, are kind of beyond just being a, a music, you know, day to day manager. Um, yeah. Kind of saw the bigger business picture uh, through, through, through Peter's eyes.
there's nothing like the experience, the first hand of experience of, of being able to observe someone who's highly successful at what they do. And there's something all, just also about being in a major, major city like New York, the city that never sleeps. I mean, I was just there three weeks ago and I was walking down the street to looking for a slice or the perfect bagel and I heard 10 languages. You know what I mean? You're, of course, you're going to rise to the occasion. Of course, you're going to grow and change and evolve in an environment like that, man, you know? Yeah, that's and that's why I always say I, I want to be the least talented or smartest person in the room if I can be, you know, like that's I want to surround myself with people that are, you know, yeah, we're doing things that I could only dream of. And then just just by, you know, it's osmosis if, if you're around that. And that's the same way Berkeley was, you know, it was just all these super hyper driven musicians that were all, you know, again, it was very competitive. Like you had a number that everybody was ranked by there's four numbers, you know, one's like how well you can read, how, one's how well you can improvise, one's technique, I forget the other one is, but then there's a sheet and you can see every drummer in the school and where they are on the list. Wow. And no, no warts and all, no secrets. What was your strength? Was it the reading? Was it improvisation? Yeah, I coming from the 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 big band background with my high school, like my reading chops were fortunately very, were really good. Um, so that, that kind of helped me when I first got to Berkeley kind of, you know, get, get the numbers that you needed to be in the good ensembles. And, um, but again, I mean, there were so many incredible drummers there at the time. I, I remember, I'll never forget the first, I think it was that first day that there was like a, a concert for all the incoming freshmen and Antonio Sanchez was playing drums. You know, so I, I'm I'm coming in from Iowa where, you know, I was, you know, the top drummer in my high school. And now I'm at Berkeley where I'm just one of hundreds, you know, like just showing up. And then I sit down and watch Antonio Sanchez just completely destroy like my brain, just like doing the all the independent stuff with the claves and the technique yeah. and ups and the musicality. And I was like. Oh, I'm not in Iowa anymore. Like this is, you know, but you ended up doing a package with him. You know, it's, you ended up working with a lot of your heroes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, yeah, we, I think we kind of knew each other a little bit at Berkeley. He was I think a senior, my freshman year, but yeah, he was there. And then, you know, other great drummers, Kendrick Scott, who's an amazing, you know, jazz drummer. And, um, it was a wild time. I mean, John Mayer was, was there. We actually became, we weren't friends. We didn't know each other while he was there, but it was, in 2000, I just graduated Berkeley. I was still there for the summer, and he had just signed his record deal with Aware. He hadn't recorded yet, and was coming to Boston for Fourth of July just to kind of hang out because he had a bunch of friends. Um, uh, and he needed a place to crash. And my roommate Bob was out of town, and somebody was like, "Oh, you haven't yet? Yeah, reach out to Ryan." So, like, yeah, John stayed at my place for a week uh, in July of 2000, and. I had a drum kit set up and we had a PA PA in the apartment. So we jammed. Every, oh yeah. But more than that, we would, John, we would put the PA speakers in the window and John would stand in the window. Cause we, I'd lived on Boylston street right above the bookstore. So a lot of foot traffic down on the street and he would see people walking down the street and just start making up a song about him. And it'd be coming out of speed, you know, and I'd be drumming along, whatever it was. Wow. It's not, there's a video of it somewhere. I think John, John was, he probably has those tapes somewhere, but just, we would just spend hours and he would just make up songs about people that were the funniest, you know, things. And then we'd also be working on the songs that ended up on like, you know, room for squares. Like I was, you know, kind of hashing it out with them as he was figuring out. Dude, the part. That's an incredible story for your freaking memoir. It's so funny is that your stories are like six degrees of Kevin Bacon stories. Like they're almost more like three degrees of Kevin Bacon stories. I mean, really? Oh, you yeah. know, yeah, John Mayer was hanging out with me and we were like, you know, developing the material for the room of squares. And then he, you know, he took it into the studio and they passed it on to near, but you know, we, we, we basically hashed it all out. Those are all my ideas. I'm not going to take too much credit for it. But I mean, but I mean, it's know. badass, dude. That's cool. It was fun. And there's, yeah, there's, I have pictures somewhere. I don't know where they are, but we had a party on the the night of the 4th of July, like just all these random people, like, cause we, again, we had the windows open. And if you know, Boston on 4th of July, it's a madhouse Cause everybody goes down to the river where they do the, uh, the fireworks and we yeah. just live a couple blocks off the river. So literally it was a sea of people down on the street and John was playing his new songs 
and like literally throwing demo CDs out the window to people. Like that's smart. Like a rapper, man. You oh, just yeah, got yeah, yeah, guys exactly. in New York that'll come in and be like, "Hey, I'm a rapper. You check this out." And he was like throwing CDs yeah. to and anybody that would take them, and um, and uh, yeah, all these people came up to the apartment, and and Mark Kelly was playing bass from. He's in the roots now, but he was a friend. And then uh, Matt Mangano was also playing bass. Who's um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the band he plays with. Um, It'll come back to you in the middle of the night. You, yeah, they're based out of Nashville. Uh, Text anyway. me and you, and I'll put in the show notes. Uh, you know, it's so funny is people give me so much gr- just hell about my drumming faces, and I'm like, well, what about John Mayer? He makes a lot of crazy faces, man. But he's a guitar player. He gets away with it, I guess. You know? Yeah, I guess guitar face. Yeah, dr- I mean, drum face, it should be, you know. Drum equal. face is real, man. It's 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 a real thing. I, I can't avoid it. I've tried to not do it, but then I sound horrific. No. You know, you're thinking about it too much. You're like, sounds too academic. Um, But hey, so that band that you were playing in, the cool indie rock band, remind us of the name and are you guys on Spotify? I think he, yeah, the, the band is called The Rents. R I N T S. Yeah, Washington. It, it was another weird name because people are like the Rents. The Rent, you know, it was like no, the Rents. Um, so yeah, I think there might be like a demo on Spotify. Maybe I don't know. It's it's, it's um, again like the album that we were gonna do with Columbia never got you know never happened and um, but I had a great time with those guys. Like I'm still close with all those. Uh, those guys, the guitar player went on to be the editor in chief of Playboy magazine. Good job. Uh, who know? Yeah, it's like the most random thing. I'm sure. We, I think he left Play, Playboy recently. And then the singer, uh, this guy Will Bates, who has a company called Fall on Your Sword, um, does all these major documentary soundtracks and has a big studio in LA. And mm. um, so we'd still get together when I was living in LA, like once a year, and like record and you know for a TV show or just just a reason they get together and play so that's awesome yeah so still still friends of you know all that's guys. good man yeah you maintain these relationships now i don't want to hash this out a million in a million places because it's been on a couple of the podcast interviews you've done but i think it's an incredible story you got to share with the audience your robin williams story oh man yeah that's a, that's that's i mean that's, you made robin williams a roadie he made i didn't make him do anything he it, so the story is um, so Peter Asher, his best friend was was Robin Williams, um, and I had no, never met him because Robin lived in San Francisco, um, so I didn't see him like when we stayed at, at Peter's house in Malibu. But we were doing a little West Coast tour, just in the van, you know, DIY kind of just playing these little dingy clubs, and uh, it was this place called R- Rickshaw Stop. I don't know if it's still there in San Francisco, but it was just kind of this hipster nightclub that turned into a dance club at you know later in the night um oh, but yeah. we were play, playing there and, and peter you know called early in the day he's like you, i'm gonna bring uh you know robin do you think you can get him on the list i'm like yeah i think i can get robin williams on the guest list <laughs> like that shouldn't be a problem so yeah I, I tell the door guy you know robin williams and peter asher on the list please and you know i'm kind of nervous just like oh my god Ro- i'm gonna see robin williams tonight and so he's there and i i you know i see him during while i'm playing on the show i'm just like freaking out and we i hit the crash of so the last song and you know it's time to get the gear off the stage because the dj had to set up to do his thing for because it was about to turn into a dance club and uh i think robin saw that i was kind of frantically trying to to break my gear down and he jumped help on the drummer help the drummer Put this total like cockney accent on it like acted like he was a, a roadie for like you know iron maiden or something and just like just did this whole thing but was helping me like taking my drum set apart and taking the wing nuts off the cymbal stands and break you know breaking the tripods tripods down and like and a lot of times people will do that and they're just horrible at it they're like actually slowing you down but you, what are you going to tell robin williams you know, he, was he was actually, actually probably doing a great job because he's like a but, he's like a like like it seems like a cocaine induced you know euphoria yeah, like, you know, I'm a meth method actor. He was, he was, he was doing it right. So, um, I have a picture. Of, so yeah, if you go, uh, there, there's a story on my blog somewhere uh, about that. If you just Google Robin Williams roadie, you'll you'll find the whole story in the in the picture. Um, but yeah, that was one of the crazier nights. I'm sure you've had, you know, you meet all kinds of people on the road, but like, this is Robin Williams inside. You know, we weren't we weren't playing a big venue. We were playing this little club in San Francisco, and you know that that was my special 
I mean, I'm so glad I got to meet the guy. Yeah. Um, what what, what a sad ending. Ah, oh, so sad. Oh, I, yeah, I was totally gutted when I, you know, I, I still remember where I was when I heard the news. It was just yeah, hard, hard to believe. I mean, but. a person like that kind of only comes along every 20 years or so. You know, yeah, he was, he was, about, you could see this aura around him, like literally, like in, in person. There's just this magic about, about him and his personality. And yeah, definitely, definitely miss, miss having him here. Yeah. I've never, I've had some interesting experiences in my life, but never one of the greatest comedians in the world, uh, break, helping me break down my drums. But, yeah. That's, um, yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be able to top that story. That's kind of, it's, it's, it's one for, that's one for the book. memoir. Yep. Yep. Someday. That is amazing, brother. I mean, all this success, man. I mean, this is really, really great to be able to combine you, all of your, you know, natural God-given abilities and and to, you know, to to be winning. I mean, you are winning at life. You're a business owner that is moves units, man. I mean, you're changing people's lives. You're giving them the powers to the tools to be creative, but you're winning, man. I mean, it's like you're not waiting for the phone to ring to go play Brown Eyed Girl you know, at a wedding, you know, or you, you are running a business and right now you are making money. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's a grind. I yeah. mean, it's, you know, but when you do what you love, it doesn't feel like work. You're just, you're just doing it. You're like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, do, I'm do you have a team or is it just all you? No, I've, I've got a great team. I mean, not, not a huge company, but I've, you know, have, you know, somebody that does customer support and somebody that does all the audio editing and, you know, some other people to help with some marketing stuff. But I met that audio editing kid, editing kid. We went out together. Oh, Zane. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's Zane. We ran into um your buddy, uh, Luke Bryan. Oh, yeah. We ran into Luke Bryan at uh, Drake's. Sure, Drake's. And yeah. That was, that was our spot. That was you and I's spot. Whenever we would work, we've been to Drake's after. at least three times. Yeah. That was our after, after you know after studio hang yeah, yeah I remember sitting there some guy came up and gave you a bear hug and i was like this guy looks familiar and you're like hey right oh, yeah. hi i'm luke Bryan. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean everybody everybody in nashville is so approachable that's what's so great about it it's like a it's not a paparazzi town because these people are just so approachable and they're just like oh yeah i do my shop and at trader joe's oh, yeah you, know? you see you know cheryl crow at dunkin donuts and you know the whole thing so yeah uh, it's, i i do miss you know miss the proximity of, of being in, around all that stuff, you know, I'd, it's not quite the same here in Des Moines, but you know, yes, yeah. yes, close to family and that that's that's a beautiful thing. So no, it is a beautiful thing, man. Um, well, so what is what is uh, you know being in business taught you all these years? If you have somebody that's not even a drummer, I mean, I know you have the advice that you would give a drummer, but somebody that wants to bootstrap a business, the American dream, and start their own business, I know that. You know, you had some luck. You're you're a very hard worker. You're a very methodical guy. Um, I believe at one point you had some angel investors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's two friends that you know, kind of. So this is in 2012, where I was two years into the company, and it was again, it wasn't like a huge success overnight. It took time, and um, there's a little doggy we behind you. Yeah, that's Stella. Oh that's yeah, Stella. Hey. Yeah, yeah, Stella. Um, yeah, was wasn't not an overnight. Not, nothing's an overnight success, as you know. It uh, may appear, appear that way to people, like on the exterior, but it was slow going in the beginning. You know, I had no. I started the company. I had so I was like, how do I get people to even come to this website? I would post Craigslist ads in all the major cities, and just say free drums. You know, so people would think, oh, I'll get some free drums, but it was free drum loops, just come to my website and like enter your email address. And like, it would, that was a way just to get traffic and to get people to come. And, and then you, know, you got email addresses that you can build a the, uh, email list. As you know, like the emails uh, are, are, I mean, that's massive to any company is, you know, it's, yeah. but uh, yeah, it wasn't overnight. It was, you know, eventually I would reinvest all the profits. Like Facebook ads were a new thing in 2010. And I would just, that was the best way for a digital marketer at the time. And still is, I actually, ironically. And um, you were telling me you still use Facebook ads as a main marketing tool. Yeah, it's just, it's so good at finding the right audience. And, you know, and what I, my product is something you can't see or, you know, you can hear it. So like being able to like show ads where you can like hear the drum loops, that's key, you know, like, because I, I, 
you know, was testing everything in, in the early days, like print ads and like those, you know, didn't resonate, no pun intended. Um, yeah, no, I can't imagine. Yeah, people want to see, and you're really, you got really good. I don't know if you do the videos, but all of my products have these killer, you know, behind the scenes videos and they're exciting and they show me tracking and then they show the DAW and they show how easy it is to open up the plugin and use the loops and what they sound like. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah, you know, it's like kind of just a, I want to say a templatized process, but like there's, a, I, I know how to kind of display the product, which is this, this untangible thing to be, you got to just show it in use and then show the musician recording it and then obviously what it sounds like and the ease of the ease of use because a lot of yeah. people think oh my god how do I, I don't know how to start well you just drag and drop it into your software and there you go so it's you know it's it's so and it's exciting now because especially after the pandemic like everybody be became a producer like everybody started to learn how to self-produce and like that opened up a the market got even bigger. And of course, you know, when I started drum loops, doing drum loops, it wasn't like an industry of, of any kind. And then over the years and splice came around and then they got, they actually tried to acquire the loop loft too, but oh, I wow. ended up selling to native. Um, but it, it became this massive industry and, and it's still like, you know, it's a, you know, a great way for, for, you know, an, another revenue stream for musicians, you know, a mailbox money. You know, yes. You can always, you never have too much mailbox money. Yeah, no. So, I love getting those quarterly checks. And yeah, I mean, it's I love being able to give my favorite musicians, you know, royalties. It's you know, yeah. it's that's 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 one of the highlights of this job is to you know everybody wins and it's just a, you know and they're all they're not just artists. They're you know you're a good friend. Everybody's a good friend. You know, everybody I'm close with and you know, constantly. It's a lot, you know, a lot of communication, but that's, you know, it's again, like it's, yeah, when you're friends, you don't feel like it's work. It's just, I'm just constantly talking to, you know, a hundred different musicians. Yeah, you're constantly mixing business and pleasure. And, you know, it speaks for itself. I mean, you have people that are, have left testimonials like, you know, Pete Townsend loves your rock and all the reviews for a lot of the products are five star over the top, incredibly positive reviews. You know, when I read a review and it's like, this is a knock it out of the ballpark. Great sound. So easy to use. It's it's helping my creative juices. Well done. You know, I mean, it's like, yes. Yeah, it's, it's rewarding. And like, yeah, the people I've met through owning this company are like like Pete. You know, I, I every day I scan the order list just to see if names pop out. And one day I saw Peter Townsend. I was like, Pete. what are the chances? Yeah, you know, and they, I, I look at the address and, you know, it was, you know, an estate in the UK. And I was like, oh, my God, it's really him. You know? He lives and, in a castle. And like, so, you know, I, I reached out to him a, a few days later and just sent him a really nice note. And no need for, you know, Pete, you've inspired me enough. Here's, you know, everything. And thank you so much. And we kind of struck up a, you know, friendship over email. And he's just been really kind and supportive over these past couple of years. And that's how I met Butch Vig. Same, same way. Like, I was... I was that I was in, it was probably 2015 or 16. I was here in Iowa. I remember in line at Starbucks and just scrolling through the app and Butch Vig. I was like, what? He's buying my drums. I was like, what's going on? Like this, you know. And <laughs> so, and then now, you know, we're, we, he's still, he's, he's a good friend. We actually produce our, our own loops together um, with, with the studio called Rancho de la Luna. Uh, out of Joshua Tree. So if you go to Rancho de la Luna Loops .com, you can uh, purchase uh, loops that Butch and I produced with uh, the guys at Rancho. Um, That's great. Now, did Butch, Butch play the drums or? He did not play. He he was, his role, well, we kind of co-produced it. Then he he took it all back to his house. Uh, he's got a great like home studio at his place in, in LA and just spent the past year like mixing these three drummers um, and he's so good, like sonically with like the Butch Fig drums instrument that we did at Native. Like that was, that was, that was like a dream project because it was, you know, getting to go into the studio with Butch Fig, who's one of my all time favorite producers. And then having the budget to bring in cartage of just like all these different drum kits at, at United Studio A. So like one of the best studios in the world designed by Bill Putnam and with, you know, it was like a pin another one of those pinch me moments. Yeah. Um, and doing this all for native instruments. So if 
yeah, it's part of the, if you have the complete bundle, check out the Butch Vig drums. That's Oh, that is great. And, you know, for the youngsters that, that might be genera- generationally apart from us, uh, if they don't know who Butch Vig is, he produced these groundbreaking records with a band called Nirvana, De Pluckish, De Pluckish, De Pluckish. And um, then he went on to have his own band called Garbage, which is uh, electronica rock at its finest. Yeah, so yeah, Butch is a great drummer as well as a producer. And yeah, I mean, so many albums like you know, Smashing Pumpkins and Foo Fighters and Green Day. And like he it's, he left such a mark on me, like just all the stuff, you know, and then you get to meet, meet, and become friends and work with these people. It's, you know, um, goosebumps here. They are. Um, There's a goosebump it's, moment. You know, this is why. This is why we do it, you know. It's, yeah, it's just to meet heroes and and just kind of connect with people like that. It's 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 amazing. Well, you're endlessly positive. You're affable. You're approachable. You know, you have a business mind. You're a great musician. Um, I could see why you are so successful, my friend. And and you know, the Yurt Rock is on fire, and everything is moving forward, and the c- content just continues to grow. What's on the horizon for you? Is there I'm sure you want to just keep growing your company, but are there any kind of like interesting little um, goals or uh, New Year's resolutions you're kind of working on? Um, like I mentioned, the the podcast thing and the YouTube channel is going to see a lot more love here. You know, it's not not going to just be product videos. There'll be, I mean, the podcast stuff will all, also live on YouTube and um, just getting into to more broader content more than just drum loops and um definitely getting into some plug-in kind of stuff this year as well and you know now now that i'm because when, when i started year rock i was basically starting over from scratch i had zero products you know native instruments still owns the loop loft which yeah that was eight eight years of blood sweat and tears and you know hundreds of products and um uh but they, you know, they they acquired it and they still own it. So when I, when my contract was up and I wanted to start over again, it was starting from scratch and yeah. rebuilding. And so you know, you couldn't, I couldn't just build, you know, like plugins off the bat. I needed content to put in the plugin. So I spent these first three years just head down, focused on producing the best content possible. And now we're at the point where I can like, okay, now how do we merge this with some software to make the experience even better? for uh the, the customers so how do you how do you like as a as a solopreneur i know you have a small team you're a drumpreneur and you're a solopreneur um how do you how do you uh you know kind of like dedicate your time to whatever you need to dedicate it to like is every day completely different is there a work day that you keep like like i gotta work i'm gonna get dressed and i'm gonna work nine to five and then at five o'clock it's all about my family do you have like rules and systems and processes yeah i keep a very strict um monday through friday you know i am my computer my laptop so i spend the mornings not in here i spend it sitting in the, in the family room on the couch with my laptop and that's like you know doing all the admin stuff email and just any businessy kind of admin stuff that's not creative i i tried to do all that stuff in the morning as i'm waking up just because most nobody you know definitely not a morning person but i can get all that stuff out of the way and then i leave afternoons open for the you know the, the fun stuff the producing the content and making the videos and doing all that stuff and recording sessions um but yeah i have a family i have two kids and a wife and i try to you know at I'll work till six some days, five thirty. But I, you know, it's definitely when dinner time is on. We're sitting down as a family at the table, and yeah, you know, and my son's playing guitar now. So like, you know, yeah, downstairs and jam with him, or you know, just do whatever, watch a movie, and um, try to get off my computer. But you know, again, I'm you know at night before bed. I'm all you know always. It's hard. It's hard to stop when you have your own company because there's always something it's, going it's, on. Or- it's twenty four seven. When I when I see that, um, I've never done this, but I, I really don't even know how to do it. But it's, uh, such and such has silenced their notifications. I, you know, I'm just like, oh, wow. I that's that's a luxury. I always feel like I just gotta have, even if like there's no sounds or buzzing or you know i i just gotta at least have the phone to where that you know if somebody's got an emergency you know can you do a 10 a.m yeah, session you know and it's yeah, 11 I mean, p.m 
I try not to check even like mail uh, email like I those are things they can be distractions that get you off track so like you know I, I do it in batches so I call yeah. I'll keep my email off I'll turn my phone off or put it on do not disturb and then it's just head down focus you know for an hour or two and then take a break and then you know I'll sit down and do the email and stuff like while I'm eating lunch and then I'm trying you know taking care of your body like I try to go to the gym you know three or four times a week and that's you know for anybody like you gotta I mean if you take care of yourself it's because you know, when I wasn't doing that you know your pro- productivity goes down your energy goes down your focus goes away and like it doesn't I don't care what you do like you just take you got to take care of yourself first before you can you know if you want to be successful at anything you've got to have a healthy mind and body you know that's great advice yeah yeah no I'm at, I'm at the gym every damn day but now we're snowed in here and it's like well I guess I can use my calisthenics app um and just you, know. you gotta do like I told you I I, I did the shovel shoveling and snowblower today instead instead of the gym so that, that was, counts man you're good for Mar- you're good because I'm because you're I'm keeping you from margaritas at this point hey let's close our experience here with the uh, the favorite five and you could answer relatively quickly no big deal but these are your favorite five things what's your favorite color blue nice like a royal blue baby blue any kind of blue just a yeah nice royal blue you know that's nice like a- royal blue have you ever had blue drums um have i no well i i did i do have a uh a pearl it's not a vistalite i forgot what they're called they're the clear pearls they have the led lights inside so oh, the acrylics yeah yeah the acrylics uh, uh i'm forgetting the name but they sound great they're cool but they, they had i it's a company i don't know if they're still around called drum drum light um and they have these led strips you can put inside your drums and nice um I need to fix it. It's not working right now. But yeah, te- technically, I it was blue whenever it was on. So yeah, blue. Okay. And then what about food? You got a favorite uh, food or dish? Uh nachos. I'm a nacho guy. I'm a really yeah. so like uh, covered in beef, like supreme or just cheese. Oh, supreme. You know, like that, that used to be a thing at Berkeley when I, Bob and I we would um we would set aside like we we're very very anal about like just cleanliness and stuff so we would like clean the apartment like deep clean it like once a month and then like our our treat at the end was i would make nachos for us and <laughs> this is such a incredible yeah, you know like that that was our reward for cleaning that's like our- that's like something out of bosom buddies uh you know that's crazy um let's see what about your favorite drink favorite drink i mean we're all I'm double fisting LaCroix right now. Uh, we, I, we pound those at your place when we work. Yeah, I, I go through, a, literally, I go through a 12-pack a day of the, it could be worse, there could be other things, but... Um, definitely, yeah. definitely Red Bull. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, I used to do that in in, in New York. My, my friends worked at marketing in Red Bull. They would drive the Red Bull truck cars around, and like, I would get endless amounts of, I would drink like four or five a day and just Whoa. be totally act out of my mind yeah your heart your heart is like yeah this is when i was in my you know late 20s you know i could I, my heart could if i did that today i would i'd be dead and oh my god that, <laughs> that is crazy how about your this is tough for a lot of people uh, a lot of people say it changes day to day but your favorite song is there a song that comes on the radio that if that sucker comes on you're cranking it up you're listening to it no matter what oh man i think don't let me down by the beatles nice oh, man. such a positive you know it's just or it's not it's just one of those anthemic kind of and i, I love to play with my son and it's just ringo's drumming on that you know <laughs> everything about it is just so yeah that's that's probably my favorite song i love it time. peace and love peace and love and then your favorite movie 16 candles what why i don't know i was obsessed with that movie like I guess I was probably in junior high when I first saw it. Maybe it's just the fun. I don't know. It's just those those John Hughes movies from the eighties, man. Like automobile. Yeah, yeah. Long Duck Dong, and you know. So, did, did, do you like redheads, Molly Ringwald? I don't know what it, it's the whole thing. Just like I, I wasn't in high school yet, so I, I thought that's what high school. Well, I mean, high school is kind of like a lot like that, and <laughs> which is why it's so relatable. Um, you know, you got the jocks and the popular people and like the nerds and like every, you know, I was, you know, I wasn't a jock. I was kind of this band nerd. And I was know. a band nerd too, dude. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, was, I, I blossomed later. Um, 
Yeah, no, those societal labels. It's like it was a it was a an omen for things to come. Uh man, I'm so excited we got to spend this time together. I'm so excited we have three products together. I'm so excited we're friends. Um, I wonder if we're coming to Des Moines this year. If so, we'll have to like get together again. I'll have to look at the tour dates. Um, but uh man, yurtrock.com, everyone that's Y-U-R-T Rock, yurtrock.com. That's where you download very affordably amazing music making tools. I think it's the number one site. Is it the number one site in the world for music making tools? It should I be. Would say so. It should be. I mean, it's we're you know we definitely we're growing fast and um you know mix it, it it's I've gotten your rock to the point it that took me eight years to get the loop off to in a matter of you know two and a half so because you're smarter and savvier and the world is moving faster. Yeah, I made all those mistakes the first time and had my network my connections you know going into it so it was a little I wasn't having to you know email Matt Chamberlain out of the blue and try to convince him that this this kid and you know I was in Boston at the time you know like I would reach out to these people and it was always kind of like drum loops why would I do drum loops but now it's you know it's people yeah people dig it it's fun it's fun for everybody so it really is I'm just happy to be in the mix man thank you so much and thank you for uh you know giving empowering people you know to change their lives and to make great music affordably the democratization of music making yeah, man. <laughs> I could do your voiceover. Um, well, I'll let you run and have a great time with your family. I just wanted to, hey, remind all the listeners out there, Ryan, I spent a year writing this book, man, making it in country music and insiders look at the industry. Just call Jeff Bezos, Amazon.com. He'll deliver it to your house. You can download it to your Kindle or your iPad. Leave us a nice review. And if you love the show, I'm assuming you'll love the show. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. Ryan, I had a great time, man. Likewise, Rich. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. I hope to see you soon. Thanks again for being here. And to all listeners, thanks again. We'll see you soon. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.